uh, we look for life in the universe, and we want to know how, how life uses elements to sustain itself and to maybe form on other planetary bodies, and where in the solar system and where in the universe should we look for life? Um, and using elements is a really good way to look. Where are the elements that are required for life? Where are they not? So these are some of the things I'll be talking about today. There we go. Cool. OK, so here's your standard phosphorus atom. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit today about valence electrons. And as boring as that sounds, it's really cool. Um, so if you guys want to just count the uh, outer electrons, can someone just shout out how many there are? There's, there's five, right. So there's five in the outer shell, um, which means that it can hold three more. So it's actually fairly reactive. It's a fairly reactive element. And as Ron said, it's, it's when we find it, we don't find it in nature just by itself. It's already reacted with something else. Um, as a astrobiologist and a human being of planet Earth, why am I fond of phosphorus? Well, potty talk reasons. Um, like any good astronomer, we love Uranus jokes. Um, do you guys want to know why I wanted to study astronomy? Sure. To observe Uranus. <laughs> it's like my best joke I have. OK. Uh, so it's got a great element uh, symbol. It's P. It was first isolated from urine, which is hilarious. Some, some dude with fake hair just peeing in a pot and letting it sit and boiling it. It's pretty funny. Um, I also like it because it's in poop. <laughs> it's highly concentrated in guano, which is bat poop or bird poop. Um, and it's, that's one of the, one of the ways they uh, make fertilizer. So getting back to astrobiology, um, all life needs phosphorus. We learned that it's in the backbones of DNA. It's an ATP. Um, if you want to be really cool and hip in the astrobiology world, you got to know CHNOPS. Uh, that stands for the six elements that are required for all life as we know it to exist. So if you had a Venn diagram of all of the elements that life had, it'd be these uh, elements here, these six elements. And that uh, stands for carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur. Um, so, uh, we also learned that phosphorus is in the phospholipids, the cell membranes. So like every cell in your body has phosphorus. I already said this, and plus this font right here is called phosphate. Pretty snazzy. OK, I thought it was really cool. <laughs> OK, so before we get into the astrobiology, I just wanted to take a step back and talk about the phosphorus cycle that we have here on Earth. Um, so we talked about phosphorus is great for fertilizers. Um, so the gist of it, if this confusing diagram doesn't do it for you, is that Rain erodes rocks from mountains and whatnot and puts it into soil. And life takes that phosphorus from, or phosphate from the soil and is like, sweet, I can grow. Then it grows and then it dies. Uh, or something eats it. And those animals that eat uh, these plants get phosphorus that way. And once everything dies, it goes back into the system. Um, and eventually, it runs off into rivers and estuaries and it actually can be a problem. So we have these uh, phosphate concentrations. Here is going from uh, low to high, um, all in our oceans due to man-made use of phosphorus in our fertilizers. Um, and it's not as huge of a problem in the oceans as, as it is in fresh water. And I'll get to that in a second. But um, it's usually coupled with nitrogen in fertilizers. And nitrogen in the ocean cycle is pretty bad. Um, what's also bad about having, uh, for life, um, what's also bad about uh, having phosphorus in your water is that it's not really a renewable thing. It's, we mine phosphorus, and then it's gone. It goes into the water. We don't have a way to take it out and put it back in uh, as of yet. We're not really recycling our, our phosphorus. So there's an estimate that we are reaching about our peak uh, phosphorus or phosphate uh, mining capabilities in the next 
uh, I've heard that zero to 30 years, and we might even deplete our phosphorus resources in the next 100 years to 200 years. So we gotta start thinking about, okay, maybe we should not, maybe we should have some sort of collection of this or start thinking about this collectively as a human species. Uh, phosphorus in, in fresh water creates a problem called eutrophication. Um, anyone know what eutrophication is? A couple people? Okay, so I'll give you the gist of it. This is actually taken from where I grew up, um, near the Potomac River in the DC area. And if you get too much phosphorus runoff, algae love it. It's a limiting factor in algae life and a lot of uh, water plant life. And if you have a lot of it, they're like, sweet, I can grow, and then they cover the whole surface, and it looks like this, and then sunlight can't get to the plants at the bottom of your stream or lake, um, and they start to die, and eventually this algae will start to die, and it's all gonna sink to the bottom, and these bacteria are gonna love it. They're gonna start to uh, decompose it, and it's gonna suck all of the oxygen out of your system, and it's gonna kill all the, the animal life in your system. So it's kind of a bummer. Um, so if you see this, this is a bummer. Um, we don't want, we'd like to not have this. So, excuse me? I think, the early, I think this is when the algae bloom is, is happening. So it's starting to block the light out underneath. And then once this starts to die, it's bad news bears. Okay, astrobiology, chinops. Remember, like, you need to be cool in the astrobiology world, you gotta say chinops. All right, so here are the, uh, the elements in chinops. Uh, again, I'll go over them. Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur. There's so much to make a rap about that. I don't, don't look at me, right? I don't have one. So Ron nicely described how phosphorus is used in DNA and in ATP. We have our, sorry my, my slides don't have any flaming transitions, but uh, phosphorus is used, it's basically what, how we get our energy, it's our metabolism, we use ATP for that. Um, so it's really, really important. Phosphorus is the 11th most abundant atom in Earth's crust. It's also found in a mineral called Schreibersite, if you want to be correct, not Schreibersite. Um, a little bit later we're going to talk about finding phosphorus in Comet 67P, the one that the Rosetta mission visited. Uh, it's the least abundant element in chinops, and it's actually qu it's difficult, more difficult to form in stars than you'd think, and we'll go into that a little bit later. So here we've seen this slide before, but phosphorus sits right here. Do you get, who remembers how many valence electrons phosphorus has? Five. Okay, we're gonna, I'm gonna quiz you guys again on that. Um, so it sits right here. It's formed in large stars. And it's formed by nucleosynthesis inside of stars. Uh, so basically, atoms are f uh, pr uh, protons and neutrons are fused together. Um, you're going to get, whoops, uh, all of the elements uh, that are bigger than hydrogen and helium from uh, stars and cosmic rays. So what's interesting about phosphorus, it's, it's called an odd Z number. And that means it has an odd proton number. It has 15 protons. Um, and we learned that it's a stable isotope with 16 neutrons. That means it has either more or less neutrons than it does protons. Um, and that's actually harder to create in stars than even number of protons. Uh, and you actually need a slightly older universe to start producing odd number. Uh, it's easier for older evolved universe to produce odd number um, a neutral, excuse me, a nucleus. So here we can see that in a graph that we have here phosphorus with its odd uh, P, which is, or excuse me, Z number, which is uh, its number of protons, and it has 16 neutrons, so it's a, an isotope, which is stable, and it's less abundant than its neighbor, which is heavier, sulfur. So it's less available in the universe than sulfur, which is heavier than it, which I find fascinating. 
So I don't know if you guys remember in about 2012, 2011, there was all of this hype about arsenic life. Raise your hand if you've heard anything about arsenic life. Okay, three, four people. Cool, so do you guys remember how many valence electrons phosphorus has? Five, right. So arsenic also shares that same property as do all of these in this column here. So there's a theory that perhaps arsenic could be replaced for phosphorus in our DNA, maybe in the ATP, by arsenic. There is a lake in California called Mono Lake or Mono Lake. Uh, have you guys ever heard of Mono Lake? Yeah. Right. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, it's got higher concentrations of arsenic. So a, a researcher isolated a bacteria that could, th could thrive in these areas and it fed it primarily arsenic with a tiny bit of uh, phosphorus and it was able to grow. Um, and the thought was that it was actually incorporating arsenic into the backbone of its DNA. And this uh, study was actually not able to be reproduced and largely kind of refuted at this time. Um, but if it were to be proven, this would have changed the way we think about where we need to search for life because this would also be a plausible scenario for, for life as we know it. Um, and we'd have to change chinops to be I'm not going to try, chinopsis. <laughs> um, so we would have to expand what our, our known uh, search for life would be if that were to be true. Um, but it did get a lot of press, and this is that bacteria um, that's really resistant to arsenic. Um, it does not take arsenic up into its backbone, its DNA backbone, um, but it, what it does, they found out that it, it's r it does a really good job of uh, being able to reject arsenic. So if it has a lot of arsenic, which has the same valence electron, so the same chemical properties, it does a really good job of saying, no, you're arsenic, yes, you're phosphorus. So that's something really interesting that, that came out of that research. So this slide is titled, Where Did Early Life Get Its Foss Yo? So there's kind of a, a conundrum here. So we've, we've heard about the phosphorus cycle. We know that phosphorus is quite abundant in the Earth's crust, but it turns out the phosphorus that's in Earth's crust is quite innate. It doesn't, or excuse me, inert. It doesn't like to react with anything. It's uh, not really bioavailable. So how did the first life on Earth use phosphorus if it wasn't available, it was all locked up in, in phosphate? Well, first of all, it took phosphorus quite a while to get up in the crust um, and be and start being eroded, and there's a long a lot of like there's a kind of a time gap between when phosphorus started being eroded um, and continental crust happened, and the, there's a few theories out there. Um, one of them was started about 3.8 billion years ago, after the late heavy bombardment. So there's a time in Earth's and the Moon's history when there's a high impact of meteorites. And we, we can see the evidence of that in the moon here. Um, it's from, what did I say, 4.1 to 3.8 billion years ago. And that's kind of right about the first time we've, we have evidence for the first life. So it turns out in nickel iron meteorites, there's this mineral called trybarosite. You can see it right here in this inclusion here. And it turns out that if you, well actually let me talk a little bit about Schreibericite, uh, let's, we can uh, zoom in here to look at these inclusions of Schreibericite. And if we uh, zoom in even closer, we find the true oranges, origins of it. This is like my only joke of the slides, so <laughs> <laughs> feel free to laugh and make me feel good. <laughs> uh, so it turns out, go back, whoop, go back a few slides here, that this uh, Schreibericite uh, has a lot of highly reactive phosphorus available. So if these meteorites fell or impacted the Earth after the, during the late heavy bombardment, some of it would be flung up into the atmosphere if it's a big impact uh, and kind of stay for a while up in the atmosphere. Uh, and if it fell into some fresh water, water would actually erode the nickel iron and uh, expose the phosphorus in the Schreibericite mineral. 
And in this form of phosphorus is highly reactive. It's uh, very bioavailable. So this is a really good theory for the origin of life on Earth, is coming from uh, these nickel iron meteorites. Uh, these meteorites um, tend to come from the asteroid belt right here. And what's interesting about nickel iron meteorites is that they don't, they're not in all asteroids. You have to have a certain size of an asteroid. You have to have enough time for an asteroid to differentiate. So you need to have enough time for it to form a core for those heavy elements to kind of come into the center under its own mass and to have kind of a differentiated, like what we have in Earth. We have the layers, we have the, our core and our mantle and our crust. Um, so these don't come from the crust of asteroids. These come from the core, which is kind of nice because they don't, they, it's harder to burn those up in the atmosphere. Um, and they contain this sweet element, triberthite. So they're pretty cool. And it took, it took quite some time. It takes time for meteorites like that to differentiate. It's not an instant process. And we're lucky in the solar system that we have an asteroid belt because this is basically a lots of these differentiated uh, planetesimals, which is another word for meteorite, or excuse me, for asteroid, are available. And probably the gravity of Jupiter kicked them in um, and hit Earth eventually. So we're really lucky actually to have an asteroid belt. Other solar systems, exosolar systems, might not be so lucky. So we're just gonna take another glance here. Um, so when I talk about differentiation, uh, the core is iron, nickel, or heavier elements, and the, the crust is more of a carbonaceous chondrite. There are different types of meteorites, and I have some examples up here that I'd invite you guys to come at the end of this uh, lecture to check out. So here is our iron, nickel. They're much heavier than our chondrites. And we've probably heard of chondrites in the media. There is a, a meteorite called the Murchison meteorite that was found to have amino acids in them. So there's a leading theory that actually probably both types of meteorites were really important for the origin of life on Earth. And there's a, a thought that only nickel iron meteorites, which are more commonly found in the inner solar system, closer in from the asteroid belt, um, that contain this triberocyte, um, could have bioavailable phosphorus. However, um, in this comet, the, the, the Rosetta mission visited, Comet 67P, it has a fancier name that I'm gonna butcher if I try to pronounce it, uh, they discovered phosphorus in the coma of this comet. Uh, which is really cool because it kind of means, and for those of you who aren't familiar with comets, uh, the coma is the little atmosphere that the comet produces once it starts to sublimate um, when it gets close to the sun, roughly about the distance away that Earth is from the sun. So ESA, the European Space Agency, uh, was able to detect phosphorus right here, which is super cool because it wasn't really thought to be um, in the outer solar system, which kind of gives hope to some of those icy moons like Enceladus and Europa um, that have liquid water underneath its icy surface. Uh, but if they had some method of delivery, phosphorus is ubiquitous in the solar system, which is really cool. And that about wraps up my presentation. We talked a lot about the phosphorus cycle, we talked about meteorites and how it could be manna from the heavens that, that helped uh, produce the first life on Earth, which is pretty cool. Um, so if I'm, I have a few minutes to take some questions. Are there any questions? So there are an interplanetary dust particles. 
which are kind of flowing through our solar system. And they probably were higher in the early formation of the solar system, but it's still a significant amount. Like we get space debris, something about two tons a day, I've heard. Something of that order of space dust. And questions for Ron as well, if there are. Do we have any more questions? Before you leave, we do have some business to take care of. I forgot to mention at the opening, I hope you all got your phosphorus card. And uh, it was probably on your seat, actually. But if you like the card, you'll almost certainly like the small calendar. And even more, you would like the large calendar. So to your, if you want your 2017 calendar to be elementary, we got that covered here now. So. We, all, we have those in the store. So um, if there's anyone qu have a question for me. Well, thank you for, so much for coming to our 15th installment of Everything Matters, Tales from the Periodic Table. Next month, sulfur. So get ready, bring in your gas mask, and we're gonna do sulfur next month. <laughs>